Ah, here comes Galaxy S8 Plus. Okay, I'm trying to remember who that is. Um, and Mika is coming in too. It might be Mercy. Okay, yeah, that sounds about right. Mika's here, and Galaxy. Okay, hi Mika. Uh, Galaxy S8 Plus. We're guessing it's Mercy. Who is it? Yeah. It is Mercy. Okay, good. All right. Jalen was right. Okay. That's very good. I can't remember my name sometime. Okay. All right. I never can remember my cell phone number. I never call it. So people ask me what my cell phone number is. I said, I've got to look it up. Sorry. Okay. All right, um, we had a question on a the a question on the test, and I believe this was uh, yeah I'm finding it now number nine. Okay, now uh, let me fix this so I can see it easily and also mark my place so I can turn back and make a reference to chapter 14 so I'm not going to tell you how to do the problem but I'm going to point you in the right direction hopefully okay okay no I'm in the wrong chapter it's chapter 16 okay okay and it's section 16.4. Okay. All right. So, um, I'll go to the whiteboard and get my pad here. Number nine, this is test. I mean, I also need to do a little bit of housekeeping here. This taskbar I don't think you can see, but it's right in the whiteboard, so I need to get it out of the way so I can write. And I also take the whiteboard and scoot it as far as I can to the left and up, so I'll have the maximum amount of white space on which to write. I don't know if y'all can see me moving that, but I did. It was not very big moves. Okay, this is... Uh, what test would that be? Four? Okay, test four. So I'll entitle it that way. Test four, number nine. Okay. Now, a car is tra traveling away from you at 70 miles per hour. Okay. Now that's a velocity. And let me start by writing the formula that you'll be using. Because if you did number eight, you're using the same formula. Just one minor change. F prime, now that's the frequency you hear. That's the Doppler shifted frequency. That's not the real frequency, it's the one you hear. And I think that's what the problem's asking for. What frequency do you hear? Okay? And that frequency you hear is the actual frequency of the horn, which is. Um, 500 hertz, uh, 5,000 hertz, I believe it is in that problem, isn't it? We'll, we'll write that down in a moment. Okay. Times V. Now that V is the speed of sound. And you're going to use the same speed of sound you did in the previous problem. Okay. So we'll come back to that. Okay. Or at least that's what my memory is. Okay divided by V, speed of sound, uh, and then it says plus or minus. Okay, and then you have V sub S. Now that's the speed of your source, the thing that's making the noise, okay, that's doing the frequency F, okay. Now, um, in this problem, it says a car is traveling away from you at 70 miles per hour. So that's your velocity of your source. So Vs in this problem is 70 
0.0 miles per hour. Okay, miles per hour. Okay. The car horn produces a sound at a frequency of 5,000 hertz. So that's the F that's here, the plain F. So F is equal to 5,000 hertz. And a hertz, by the way, is a per second. So I'm going to write it that way, uh, per second. That's what a hertz is. Okay. It says what frequency do you hear? So what we're looking for is F prime. That's what we're looking for. Now, if I'm not mistaken, uh, I don't have a copy of the test that you have in front of me because I think I retyped this test. Uh, does it give you a, a um, sound velocity or does it say use the one in the previous problem or did I forget to put that on there? Anybody? Okay, so sorry that I didn't write this down, but use the same sound velocity in the previous problem, which was um, uh, 1,090 feet per second. So V here is equal to, that's velocity of sound, 1,090 feet per second. Now, we have a little problem here because the velocity of the source is given in miles per hour. Velocity of the um, sound is given in feet per second. Frequency is in per second. So it looks like to me we're going to have to do a conversion here. I think I'm going to have to come down to a line down here and do it. So let's start with 70.0 miles per hour okay we're going to multiply that by a blank blank okay we're going to multiply that by another blank blank and we may multiply that by yet another blank blank what we're trying to get to is a blank feet per second now what are all those blank blanks about Remember, the first blank is always for numbers. Don't worry about the numbers until you get the units in the place. So, what? Oh, here comes Manessa. So, let me let her in. Okay. All right. Don't know if she can hear me yet, but we've got five students here. I'm the sixth, so we got it covered. Now, name a unit we need to convert. On the left, you got miles per hour. On the right, you got feet per second. Name just one of the units we need to convert. Anybody? This is on a uh, the test question, question number nine on test four. A car is traveling away from you at 70 miles per hour. The car horn produces a sound of a frequency of 5,000 hertz and it asks what frequency you do you hear. And what I had to tell you, I thought I had typed it in, but evidently I forgot. We're using the same sound velocity in the previous question, number eight which was 1,090 feet per second. So there's our setup, but we got the velocity of the source in miles per hour, the velocity of sound in feet per second, and we got frequency in per second. So it looks like the miles per hour needs to be um, converted to feet per second. So that's my setup at the bottom here. I'm asking now, name a unit that needs to be converted to a different unit. 
You only got four there, two are on the left. One of those needs to be converted to something on the right. What would you guess? Come on, somebody answer. Miles needs to be converted to feet. Perfect. Now, I'll put those in this around this blank here. Remember the second blank are the units. One goes on top and one goes on bottom. Which one goes where? You mentioned miles and feet. One goes on top, one goes on bottom. Which goes where? Miles goes on the Perfect. Miles on the bottom and feet on top. Now, do any of you happen to know how many feet are in a mile or how many miles are in a foot? That would be a little crazy. But feet per mile. Does anyone happen to know? Now, if you don't, that's okay. Okay? You got your books. You can go in your book to that table in the very back of the book, Appendix C, starting on page 686, and there's U.S. Weights and Measure. Okay? In the very first table on page 686, Table 1, U.S. Weights and Measure, and there, the in the first column, units of length, the last entry tells you how many feet are in a mile. And what is that? No, no. Okay. No. Feet and miles. Do you see that? The uh, page 686, Appendix C, tables, the very first table, units of length, and then the Last thing in that first table says so many feet are in so in one mile. And what is that? That is it exactly. 5,280 feet is one mile. And notice here the miles will cancel out, which is exactly what we want. Now, name another unit we want to convert. And we, by the way, we got feet now in the numerator, exactly where we want it in over here. We're through with feet, miles, and feet. What's another unit you want to convert? Somewhere here is, oh, there it is. This is a big hint here. Can you see my little, hours to minutes? Okay, let's do that. So we'll put hours and minutes, one of them will go on top and one on the bottom, which goes where? Anybody? Which one? Hours. If you put hours on bottom, then you're going to wind up with minutes per hour squared. Okay, I'm losing you. Did you change that to hours on top? I can't hear you anymore, okay? Hours, yeah, okay? Hours on top and minutes on the bottom, okay? Now, you answer this question. How many hours in a minute or minutes in an hour? And hopefully every one of you knows that one without looking it up. 60 minutes is the same as one hour. Perfect. So now you can get rid of your hours, okay? But we don't have minutes on this side we have seconds so guess what we got to change here you've got it minutes on top and seconds on the bottom okay and you answer me this one how many minutes in a second or how many seconds in a minute You all know it. 60 seconds is exactly one minute. Okay? So it doesn't matter how many decimal places you have. That's an exact measure. You can put it 60.0000000, as many zeros as you want to put it. It's exactly 60 minutes a seconds in a minute, and exactly 60 minutes in an hour. You can put as many point zero zero zeros after it as you want to. So don't worry about significant digits there. Those are exact numbers. 
5,280 also is exact. So all of those are significant. Don't worry about it. You only have three at 70.0, so you're only going to wind up with three. Now, I'm not going to do the math for you, but hopefully you see you multiply the 70 times 5,280, then you divide by 60 once and divide by 60 again. That gives you the number you put here. I don't know what number it'll be, so I'm going to let that go. So that's going to be your new velocity of your source. I'm just going to put it blank feet per second. Okay. Now, that's just an issue you had to take care of. Now we've got to figure out how to use this formula. Okay. Now, oh, yuck. Okay. Now, let's go back to where we were. And I've lost my page. Okay. No, I haven't. Here it is. Oh, yeah. I've got too many pieces of paper around. Okay, there's your formula. And if you notice at the very bottom of the page, this is on page 439, the very bottom of the page, the plus sign in the denominator is used when the source is moving away from you, which is what this problem is doing. The minus sign is used when the source is moving moving toward the observer. So this is moving away, if I'm not mistaken, wasn't it? Number nine? Yeah, away from you. So therefore, we will not use the minus. We will only use the plus. Okay? And then, it's you can do the rest. You plug in the 5,000 for the F, plug in the 1,090 for the V, 1,090 for the V here, plus whatever you came up with this one, and then do the math. That will give you F prime. Is that enough to get you going? <laughs> I had to sneeze and I couldn't get it out that I had to sneeze in time. Hopefully that didn't wreck your eardrums. Okay. I didn't realize that I've left my door open. And that loud sneeze reminded me my wife doesn't like to hear me teach. <laughs> okay. So I needed to close the door. So that's why I've gotten up. And I don't know what I just did there. Okay. All right. I uh, didn't hear how you answered that because I started sneezing. Was that enough for you to get the problem done? Yes, sir. All right. So I can delete all this, or does anyone need it any longer? Nobody? All right. Let's get rid of that. Okay. Now let's go back to, are there any other questions? Chapter 16, 17, anything? All right, now, where we're going to head now, before we get started on class, is let's do just a very qu quick um, review of how things are going to be going. We're in Chapter 17. We got started in it last time. We're going to continue in 17 tonight, and I was hoping we would probably get pretty close to finishing it, but we may not. Oh, here comes Molly. Let me get Molly in here. Okay, Molly's here. So we've got six people. I'm the seventh. Is that what we see? Yep. Okay. All right. Now, Molly, if you just are joining, uh, let me just say this. You'll need to go back and listen to the YouTube video once it gets loaded, which may not be until tomorrow morning sometime. Uh, we just went over problem nine on the fourth test. So if you need to review that, you can do that, but it'll be out there. I doubt if it may get finished loading tonight. I don't know. 
takes a while for this to do and then I have to move it to YouTube or I, I have to move it in YouTube to my playlist and then you can access it all right so that's what we've done so far so what we're going to do now is continue in chapter 17 and get just as far as we can in 17 this is a long chap a long section by the way we're only doing we're in 17 5 now we'll do 17 5 17 6 17 7 and 17 8 and 17 9 okay that's all we're doing but that's enough okay so that's a pretty good chunk out of 17 if we finish that tonight we'll get started in 18 if we don't finish it tonight we will go to 18 we'll finish 17 next time and start 18 okay now I know some of you have turned these in and if you have received an email from me or a message from me acknowledging the receipt that means I got them it doesn't mean I've graded them yet some of them I have graded but uh, many of them I haven't been able to put on blackboard yet uh, I'll just give you a hint uh, over the weekend okay over the weekend I had whittled this stack down to maybe that many pages since the weekend I've added about that many more so I've more than tripled or maybe quadrupled the number of paper things I need to grade and I still haven't had a chance to go back and put the great things I've already graded on blackboard so I'm going to be working on that diligently for every night this week I've got some office hours in the morning that so far I don't have any advisees signed up so that will be helpful and uh, last week I was just stacked with advisees all three days that I advise so um, so hopefully uh, tomorrow as long as no one signs up I'll be free to grade hopefully in the morning now I say grade I'm still printing stuff that was sent to me this weekend we were out of town this weekend I wasn't where we were was way out in the country had terrible internet service sometimes our phones wouldn't even work okay uh, so and then too we didn't have a printer so I could not print anything all weekend long so most of what I've been doing today and a lot of yesterday is printing things that came in over the weekend now not just over the weekend but came in yesterday and come in so far today so I just now this afternoon got all today's and yesterday's caught up and now I'm into I think I got Sunday's caught up and I'm into Saturday but I've still got a ton of things to print so the first order of priority is get everything printed second order of priority is get everything graded third order of priority is get them on blackboard okay so I've got miles to go before I sleep uh, but I'll, these are the promises I'll keep no I'll try to get things done uh, as rapidly as I can so just because you don't see a grade on blackboard doesn't mean I haven't graded it nor does it mean I haven't received it if you got acknowledgement from me that I received it that means I printed I'm going to get to grading it or I may have already graded it now if you haven't received that acknowledgement from me you know just make sure that you did send it I'm still printing and as soon as I print then I I send you the acknowledgement so hang on in the next few days we'll get all that hopefully caught up okay any questions okay so at the end of class on Thursday night uh, I will then be placing out there in fact I'll probably place it out there your test for 17 and or 18 I don't know if we'll get any into 18 or not but if we don't get everything covered that's on the test I'll let you know which questions to our bonus and which ones are need to be done okay so now once I give you that so here's okay sorry I'm all over the place here reason I'm saying this I'd love for you to get all your tests in test one I, well wait I think just about everyone's turning test one we 
had a few missing, but I think these are people who have dropped. Okay, test one. Everyone, let's see how many people we got here now? Yeah, six people. All six of you have turned in test one. There's one guy who has not dropped the course, but he hasn't been here in a very long time. He hasn't done test one. Same thing with test two. All six of you have done test two. Now test three, I think maybe all six of you have done it, but I've only have four of them graded. I may have the others in my stack waiting to be graded. Okay, test four, I know I have some of those in the stack to be graded. I don't have any of them graded yet. And I know some of you are working on test four now. So if you can possibly get me, uh, if you haven't turned in test three, which I think all of you have, but if you have it, please get me test three this week. If you have it turned in test four, please get me test four this week. Okay? That's the chapter 16 test. Uh, I will be giving you the chapter 17 test on Thursday. Okay? It may include a question or two on 18. We'll see how far we get. Okay? Now, once I give that to you on Tuesday evening, then you've got to get it back to me before by Sunday night. If you can get it back to me, Thursday, I said Tuesday, Thursday evening, that'll be wonderful, but I doubt if you can. That's just too quick. So anytime Friday would be wonderful. Saturday will be okay. Sunday, please get it to me by Sunday evening. Because if I receive a whole bunch of papers in, on Monday morning, there's no way I'll get them graded, the grades in Blackboard, the average is done, and get the grades because we have to have grades submitted by noon on Monday. So therefore, please folks, get me those tests, um, uh, the fifth test, if you can on Friday, if not Friday, Saturday, if you can't get it either one of those days, please, please get it to me by Sunday. And then I'll try to get them graded, get the grades posted, and uh, that way Monday morning all I have to do is is put the grades out on the thing, you know. So please get me that that this is the only one that you <laughs> you don't have a lot of flexibility on. This is crunch time, so you only have Thursday night, Friday, Saturday, and as much of the day as you need on Sunday to get it done. But please get it done. Any questions on that? All right. So let's pick up where we left off last time. And if I'm not mistaken, it was, uh, we we're on, we we're in chapter 17, basic electricity. We're in 17.5 simple circuits. And we were talking about some of the elements in those circuits. And we're on page 462. We'd already talked about the conductor, okay? I think I've already typed that in. So let's move now to insulators. A conductor allows current to go fairly easily, not without some resistance, but fairly easily without much resistance. And an insulator hardly lets any current go at all. It's enormous amounts of resistance. Now we haven't talked about resistance yet, so let me just type what an insulator is. Substances that do not allow electrons to pass readily are called insulators. Okay, that's what we mean by, it's basically the opposite of a conductor. Conductor is a material that allows electrons or charges in general to flow fairly easily without too much problem. Uh, those are conductors. Those that do not allow charges to flow and to pass readily those are called insulators. 
Now, by the way, insulators would be, I don't know if you can see this, hopefully you can, here's the wire that is attached to my headset, okay? There are electrical wires in there, probably copper, but maybe some other material in there, but you don't see those. I'm not getting shocked by them because this rubberized material here, plastic, whatever it is, is an insulator. It keeps the charges from going from the wire that's inside here to shocking me on my fingers. Those are insulators, okay? Uh, they're not the only kind of insulator, but they that's one example of an insulator. Okay, now, a small number of materials called semiconductors fall between conductors and insulators in their ability to conduct electric current okay now if that name seems seem sort of familiar it should I don't know if you've ever heard of Silicon Valley in California that's where a lot of the um, research and early work was done on um, modern electronics, I'll put it that way, transistors, things that make computers, um, calculators, cell phones, all that kind of stuff works so well, The main, one of the main ingredients in that are semiconductors. They will conduct electricity fairly easily in one direction but not in another direction or at some temperature but not at another temperature so it's, it's a variety of things like this that made so they're they sometimes are good conductors and sometimes are not good conductors and make insulators so they fall in between conductors and insulators and their ability to conduct electricity and they basically regulate or control um, the signals I'll just say it that way all right now, one other that we need to discuss, and it's not a big thing, especially for you, but you probably will hear of it, and it wouldn't be fair in a physics course not to mention these. A superconductor is a material that continuously conducts electric current the without resistance when cooled to typically very, and I mean very, low temperatures. Usually near absolute zero. In other words, it's as cold as you can possibly go. Okay? And they mention a guy here, I don't even know how to pronounce his name, Heineke, Heineke, uh, Kamerlink Onnes discovered superconductivity in 1911, shortly after he discovered how to liquefy helium gas, which is done at incredibly low temperatures, okay? And then once he found that out, he was able to find superconductors, because superconductors operate at incredibly low temperatures okay
So, um, because they're at such incredibly low temperatures, they're not really used that much, but where they are used, they have an, an amazing properties. Okay, usually nothing goes without uh, resistance. This is something that does. Okay, um, basically no resist all infinite current, and you can actually take away the 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 battery that's providing, and it just keeps going without ever losing uh, any energy. But it has to be kept at those cold temperatures. Okay, I won't go into any more of that. Now, then we get to, so that's all dealing with the conductor, the thing that transmits electricity, that allows electricity to flow. And here, Mika must have had to go out, and now she's back. So I've already marked her present once, so I'll leave that alone for now. Okay, welcome back. Okay, I couldn't hear that. Were you talking to me, or was that just something else? That was something else. I just lost it again. Right, okay. Yeah. Okay. Now, so we've talked about the conductor. Earlier, we talked about the source of energy. Often the battery, generator, whatever is providing the energy to the charges. Okay. Hold on just a minute. I think at some point in the afternoon... Either it cools off outside enough, which I don't think is the case, or our AC unit kicks in a little up here after a certain time. And it's 542, and that's probably about the time it happens. So it's getting a little chilly in the room, so or cooler than I had needed it, so I turned off the ceiling fan. So sorry. All right. So we talked about the source of energy, okay? usually the battery or something like that. Then we talked about the conductor that allows the charges to flow. Now we're going to talk about the next element, which is the load. Okay? And this is a fairly simple definition. Uh, okay. The load in a circuit converts the electric energy into other forms of energy or work. Remember, energy and work have the same units. Okay? So this was the load. And that electric doesn't have that many R's in it, so I will, whoops, I will remove one of them. Okay, now, that's basically your light bulb, your toaster, your television, your computer, whatever it is that is using the energy, that's the load. The battery supplies the energy, the conductor, uh, transmits that charge with the energy attached, you might say, and then the load uses it. Now, next concept here is that of current. And we've been using the word a lot. Um, the flow of this fairly simple definition, the flow of electrons through a conductor is called current. All right. Now, this is the first one in a while that's going to be a little bit more than just a word definition. This is actually going to be a formula. Okay? And I think I will write it. It's in your book, bottom of page 462. I think I'll write it down for you because otherwise it's this typing is not going to be allowed me to uh, to put it in a division okay so I'm trying to find I guess I have to okay okay what current is the symbol for current is 
I. Okay, don't need any more text. What I want is, is my draw. Okay, now I think I can work it now. So the symbol for current is I, capital I. And I do not know where that came from. It may be the uh, French word for current is starts with I. Could be the Latin word for current starts with I. I don't know. Now sometimes it is given as a little lowercase I, so we expect that too. Excuse me, I got to sneeze again. Sorry. That wasn't too painful for your ears. Okay, current is I. I can't get my pen. There it is. And current is charge. And usually charge is represented by Q, okay, per time. The t charge per unit time. Now the units for this, that's the parameters. Current is equal to charge per unit time. The units for that would be ampere is equal to coulombs per second. Ampere, capital A because it was named after Luis Ampere. Okay. We already, I think, mentioned Ampere's law. Current, uh, the charge was named after Charles Coulomb. So that's a capital C for coulombs. That's the charge, Q, and time, of course, is measured in seconds. Not named after anyone, so it's a lowercase thing. So one amp is one coulomb per second. Now remember, a coulomb is a whole bunch of, elect of electron charges. I mean, 10 to the 18 electron charges. So it's a huge number of electron charges. Of course, those charges are incredibly small amounts of charge. Uh, so a coulomb is a nice measurable unit of charge and ampere is a unit of current. That is a macroscopic unit that would measure that. Okay, now the next slide that's, or picture that's given is, this is going to be pretty ugly, but let's show a battery here. I'm going to draw as if it's a 9 volt battery uh, because a 9 volt battery is usually oblong like this something like this and it has a positive terminal and a negative terminal so I'm going to put a plus here for positive a negative here for negative okay now I'll put it above it so you can see it better okay if we connected a conductor a wire from here to there you wouldn't do that but if you did actually electrons flow in this direction but what we call conventional current we say flows in this direction. Now why do we say that? Because in physics, in every other form of physics, and a material will flow from high potential to low potential. But because an electron is a negative charge, it flows in the opposite direction. It flows from low potential, the negative potential, to the positive, which is a higher, because there's excess electrons here, that's why it's negative, deficit of electrons here so electrons flow like this but conventional charge or conventional current flows in from positive to negative now this book says on page 463 in this book this is in italicized in this book we assume that the charge carriers are positive we know they're probably not they probably are electrons but you know it doesn't matter because what's really doing the heavy lifting here is not the charge carriers themselves, it's the electric field that we talked about last time. 
that's what's doing it. That's what's moving everything. So that's where we'll leave it. That is our definition of current. Now let's move to the next one, and that's voltage. Okay. Um, we talked about the batteries. There's a picture of one right here. Okay. All right. Those are your energy sources. Okay. How we measure that energy source is in voltage. Okay. And we call that a potential difference. Um, and I don't think I'll type this in. The potential difference between two points is an electron, electric field. That's why I say is electric field in the, an electric field is the work done per unit charge as the charge moves between the two points. So there is our measure. It's called potential difference. I'm going to abbreviate it. Potential difference. Okay. And that's equal to the work done per unit charge. Okay. Now, in terms of your parameters, the letters we let stand for this, like the I, Q, and T above, whoa, here is Mika. She came back again. Evidently, she's either having problems with her system or she's having to go and come. Okay. The parameters, like this equation for current, this will be voltage is equal to, and I'll, I'll give you another name for it too, work, which is capital W, per unit charge, which is little q. The units for this, and this is a little confusing, but the units for that, like these are the units for that equation, the units for this parametric equation is volts, the same symbol, is equal to work, which is joules per unit charge, which is capital C Coulomb. All three of these units are capitalized because volts are named after Alessandro Volta, a, an Italian physicist who did the early work on voltage. Joule, we've hit before, named after James Prescott Joule. That's the unit for work. And of course, as before, the unit for charge is named after Charles Coulomb. So that's our equation for that. Now, the book will often use, rather than V, they will use the capital E. Now, one reason I really don't care to use E is so easy to confuse that with energy. Whereas W is the unit for energy. I mean, W is work or energy. So that's why I don't like to use capital E for voltage, though this book uses it quite frequently. Okay, so just stand by for that. The reason it was given E is in the old days, they called that the electromotive force. Well, it's not a force, okay, at all. So they quit calling it electromotive force. But what they still call it is EMF, which stands for electromotive force, but they don't say what it stands for. So that's why they use the capital E. The EMF is how they talk about the, the energy that's given to each charge. Energy per unit charge, that's your potential difference. Okay? Now, the last piece of information is resistance. Okay? Oh, and by the way, when, let's now make this a more realistic circuit here and say that we're going to put in this circuit, and this is just aggravates the mud out of me that it does this. We're going to put in this circuit, say, a light bulb. Okay? That's supposed to be a light bulb. Okay? shining forth light in all directions okay that's the load okay that's what we we're talking about here the load okay now when 
the voltage is supplied by the battery and I think I said I was going to draw that as a 9 volt battery so this is a 9 volt battery that's 9 joules for every coulomb that goes through here that's energy per unit charge the load uses up that so what we say the battery produces an increase in voltage whereas the light bulb the load uses that energy per unit charge so you have a drop in voltage there so we'll sometimes call that a voltage drop the battery supplies a voltage increase the load uses that energy per unit charge and that's the voltage drop all right now the reason it uses it it has a high resistance so I think I'll just say this one also this opposition to current flow is called resistance we already use the idea up here when we're talking about super conductors they have no resistance okay which is very 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 strange and unusual okay several Nobel Prizes for Physics have been won for people who have done more research on superconductivity. It's a promising field, but it's a very tough one to crack because you have to have such incredibly low temperatures. Okay, But they have made great strides in that. So the opposition to current flow is called resistance. Now, there are four main factors that enter into resistance. So I think I will go to a new slide and do those. So let's clear the drawings here and we will start over with resistance. I may go on and type that one in because these do depend, they are fairly important. Okay, so let me type the first. And this is going to be text now. Okay, here it is. The opposition to current flow is called resistance. Okay, there's pretty simple definition resistance. Okay. Okay. Four main factors. Well, there's several factors that determine the resistance of a wire, say, or of whatever you've got that's a resistor. Here are the four main ones, okay? Okay, first, these are factors. Temperature. Okay. First is temperature. All right, and here's how it affects. The higher the temperature, the more re the resistance. Now, here's what's going on. Remember, current flow, okay, current flow is charge, charge that's moving. A current is a moving charge, okay? Now, flowing through a wire, okay? Now, if the atoms, electrons, anything in the wire when you raise the temperature they tend to move faster okay that's what temperature does it increases in fact that's what temperature as a measure is the average kinetic energy of these very small particles that's what creates temperature okay now so they're moving more rapidly so therefore a current that's trying to make it through this mess of rapidly moving electrons and and atoms and, and molecules and stuff that's in the wire they hit more resistance there because they're moving faster and when they collide they bounce back further that creates the resistance so the higher the temperature the greater the resistance okay number two is length okay now we're talking about wires okay or whatever conductor you have okay the second factor is length okay now the longer the length of the wire is the more resistance it hits because 
all along the wire there's this resistance. Not a lot, very little, but the longer it is, the more those charges that are trying to move are bouncing into things. So the longer the wire, the more the resistance. The higher the temperature, the more the resistance. Okay? Number three. Cross-section area. Oops. That's the third one. Okay. Now this time, the bigger the cross-section area, the easier it is for the charges to make their way through. The smaller the cross-section area, then the harder it is to get through. Now here's sort of the fundamental reason for that. Charges move most easily through the center of a wire because on the edges that's where the most resistance is. So if you have a smaller wire then there's more edge and less center, okay? And that's exactly it. So the smaller the cross-sectional area the more resistance. Here is a dumb illustration of that. Have you ever been to the cross coffee shop or fast food place or something like that early in the morning trying to get your uh, system to wake up and you get that hot cup of coffee but they give you this little bitty swizzle stick that you can stir it with or sip the coffee very very slowly through because it has a tiny little hole in it right okay now let's just imagine that later in the day you want to go back and pick up a milkshake but say hey I've already got the swizzle stick I'm going to drink my milkshake through the swizzle stick no you wouldn't think that why you will suck your eardrums out trying to suck the milkshake through the swizzle stick because the smaller the cross-sectional area the harder it is to do the bigger straws <laughs> as big as you can get they'll make it easier to drink that milkshake because there's more resistance in the milkshake than there is hot coffee. So the smaller the cross-sectional area, the more resistance. The larger the cross-sectional area, the less resistance. And then number four. Is material. Alright. And we're going to hit something that does all these. Now, let me go back and review our materials. Which are the best conductors and which are not. The very best conductor known to man, outside of superconductors at an incredibly cold temperature, but the best conductor at normal temperatures is silver. Okay? But, <laughs> we don't make many materials out of silver because silver is so incredibly expensive. Silver is also fairly brittle. It doesn't bend easily, it doesn't shape easily, so it's just not the best thing for making wires. Best resistance, but uh, lowest resistance, but not practical. But sh right behind silver, and not very far behind it either, is copper. Copper is a very low resistance, okay, and it's also very bendable, malleable, you know, so you can make wires on it. That's why I said probably the wire in this is copper because it's easy to bend and turn around. Now you can do other things to make it easy but uh, copper. Then after copper you get other things like aluminum which is not nearly as uh, the difference between silver and copper is very little between copper and aluminum is much bigger. Much more resistance in, copper, in aluminum but it's still a pretty good uh, conductor. And then somewhere down the way you get iron and then you get other metals down there. Carbon somewhere in there. Now, let's talk about something that I think most of you are familiar with. Depends on how old or young you are. The old incandescent light bulb. You all know what I'm talking about? Not those complex, compact fluorescents. Not your LED lights. The old incandescent light bulb. If you've ever had one of those that was clear and looked at it, you'll notice something about it. 
the filament in there, that's the thing that gets hot when you put current through it. I'm going to tell you something about it. That filament, or at least the one that Thomas Edison invented, was made out of tungsten. Tungsten has a very high resistance. So that's number four of the material. Copper, very low resistance. If you made your filament out of copper, you don't get any light because it conducts electricity very easily. It doesn't get hot, so it won't glow. Tungsten, however, is a very large resistance and it gets hot very easily and the heat, that's what makes it glow and that's why it was called incandescent light bulb. So the material was a greater resistor, not as good a conductor material. Now, also if you looked at that filament that was in there, you see most of the time it's a coil. Coil, coil, going between the two posts in there, it's a coil turning many, 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 many times. If you were to stretch that out, that would have a very long length. So there's the other increased resistance. And what's more, that wire that's in there in the coil is just about the same thickness, I don't have much, but as your hair. It's a very small cross-sectional area. So again, a very large resistance. So all three of those things, material, tungsten, more resistance, long length because it's in a coil, that's a larger resistance, and very small cross-sectional area, that's more resistance. Now, I've left off temperature. Let's mention how temperature is involved. I want you to think back, if you've ever had this happen to you, that you have had a light bulb blow out on you. Think, have you? Anybody? Yes or no? Have you ever had a light bulb blow? Anybody? Yes. When did it happen? Does anyone recall? Absolutely, you got it. Right when you turn it on. And here's the reason. Because when you turn it on, that filament is cold you know, room temperature, okay? And at room temperature, it conducts more electricity. So if that light bulb had been on many, 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 many hours, very slowly that filament is getting weaker and thinner all the time. But when you first turn it on, it has a surge of current because of the low, lower resistance. That's why they usually will blow on you right when you turn them on. Once they get hot, the resistance goes down, and now less current flows, you're less likely to blow out. It's when it's the coldest is when it's likely to blow, and you're absolutely right, that's when most of the time. So you see all four of those go into the making of a light bulb. You want a lot of resistance there because you need the heat to make it glow, and that's what an incandescent light bulb does. All right. Here is the formula, and since I can't um, I can't um, type this one out because it's a division, I'll write it out here, so I have to go back to my draw mechanism here. And here is the formula. Your resistance, capital R, and by the way, that's the parameter for resistance, capital R, is equal to Rho. Now we've seen rows before. This time rho is called your resistivity. That depends on the material. Okay, like we said, silver has the lowest resistivity. Right behind it is copper. Down the list is aluminum. Down the list is iron. Way down the list is things like tungsten. Okay, and other things like that. Times the length. Well, there's your length. So we've got the material and the length here, okay? Divided by, and the higher the resistivity, the more resistance. The longer the length, the more resistance. But the smaller the cross-sectional area, the more resistance. So that's an inverse relationship. So that is your area down here. And that covers that one. 
Now, the only thing that's not included here is temperature. That's a completely different situation. So we will usually assume the temperature is either at, zero, at 20 degrees Celsius, which is room temperature, or whatever it is, and they'll just give you the resistivity at that temperature. Okay, so there's your formula. Let's see if we can work uh, the first example. Find the resistance, so what we're looking for is R. Where is my pen? There it is, okay. We're looking for R. That's the unknown here. Okay, find the resistance in a copper wire that's 20.0 meters long. That's a pretty long wire. So there's your length is 20. 0 0.0 meters okay we've just been told it's copper we'll get to that in a minute with a cross-sectional area there's your a and the cross-sectional area is 6.56 times 10 to the minus 3 this is pretty small 10 to the minus 3 square centimeters. Okay, already you should start getting bells going off in your head, warning this is in meters, that's in centimeters. We're going to have to do a conversion here. At 20 degrees, there's your temperature coming into play. 20 degrees Celsius is room temperature approximately. The resistivity, this is your rho, resistivity of copper, so that's where your material comes into play at 20 degrees Celsius, that's your temperature, is 1.72 times 10 to the minus 6 ohm centimeters. Okay, so if you had any doubt which way you need to go, since two of the three units here have centimeters in them, only one of them has meter, this time we're not going to SI, we're going away from SI. We're going to make our conversion here, if I can get my pen up here, we're going to multiply this by a blank blank to give you blank centimeters. Okay, so I'm asking you now which unit goes where. You're going from meters to centimeters, one goes on top, one goes on the bottom, which goes where? Anybody? Meters on the bottom and centimeters on the top. Those are ugly writing, isn't it? Uh, now, the question is how many centimeters in a meter or how many meters in a centimeter? Anyone know? Centi means how many cents in a dollar? How many years in a century? No, 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 no. 100 centimeters makes one meter. If you were going the other way, the meters would be 0 0.01 meters is one centimeter. But I like to use whole numbers if I can. So 100 centimeters makes one meter. So how many centimeters would be in 20 meters? A whole bunch. That would be 2,000 centimeters. 2,000 centimeters. Now, this only had three digits, so three significant digits, so this one is significant. The last one is not. Okay, now we're ready to enter our formula. We're looking for resistance, and the resistance, like we just have over here, but written too much is rho times L divided by A and rho was 1.72 times 10 to the minus 6 ohm and now we haven't talked about the unit yet we got to come back and do that I'm jumping the gun on you here uh, the book sort of got a little ahead of itself okay the unit for resistance is ohm. 
okay they haven't given that to you yet but that's what it is so that's row come on pen oh there there you are times your length and your length was 2,000 centimeters Okay, now that's significant and three digits there. So this is all pretty consistent. And divided by 6.56 times 10 to the minus 3 centimeters squared. Okay, now let's look at units for a moment. Centimeter times centimeters is centimeters squared in the numerator, centimeters squared in the denominator, they cancel out. So what does that left you? It left you only the unit of ohms, which is exactly what we measure resistance at. We'll talk about that more later. Now is time for the handy dandy calculators. Okay, so let me get mine up here. Since we're using scientific notation, I will man today okay that's okay um, all right I'm gonna turn it sideways so I can get the scientific notation that's a 1.7 no, it didn't take what's wrong with the calculator oh, there it is 1.72 EE or EXP, whichever your calculator has, and then to the minus 6 on this calculator, I have to type the 6 first and then the plus minus the change sign. So I'm going to multiply that by 2000, 2000, zero, 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 and divide that answer by 6.56 EE or EXP. And then the, to the negative third, I hit, hit uh, type the three first, then change signs, make it negative, press equal, and that gives me a resistance of, on mine it's 0 0.524, next digit is a three, so I leave, I just drop the three, uh, come on, there it is, equal to 0 0.524 ohms. That's what's left, ohms. A little more than half an ohm. Okay? And that's what the book got to. Good for them. Any questions on that? Did you follow what I was doing and why I was doing it? Okay? That finishes 17.5. So homework exercises here would be any of the odds 1 through 5 on page 464 or 7 or 9 on page 465. Okay? Now, we've been talking about resistance. The guy who first did the early work in resistance was a guy whose name was Ohm. Now, you spell his name OHM. This ohm here, if you spelled out the unit, that would be an OHM. Now, why in the world didn't we use capital O since it's a guy's name, he's a German, uh, Georg Ohm, why didn't we use capital O as the symbol for ohm? Why do we use this other strange symbol? Well, what if that we had written our answer that way? 0 0.524 ohms. Any so and see a problem? That looks like a zero. That would be confusing. We don't want to confuse people. Physics is confusing enough. So we don't use capital O. So what we usually do if we can't, I don't know where my pen is here. Oh, there it is. Okay, so we don't use that. We use, okay, something else. Well, what we usually do when we run into problems with our alphabet, we can't use a capital O. 
we go to the Greek alphabet. Remember the rho is a Greek symbol. Mu, the micro for 10 to the minus 6, that's a Greek symbol. So we usually go to the Greek alphabet to see if we can pick up some help there. Well, the letter in the Greek alphabet that corresponds to our O, especially capital O, is Omicron. But guess how the Omicron looks? Omicron is a capital O also. Okay, so no, we can't use Omicron. But the Greek alphabet is different from the English alphabet. There's a lot of similarities, a lot. Alpha, beta, gamma, A, B, we have C. They don't have a C, they jump to gamma. But then they have epsilon uh, and, you know, so they have a lot of symbols that are alike, uh, but a lot that are different. Well, they have a symbol in the Greek alphabet we do not have in the uh, English alphabet, and that's another letter that starts with O, and that's omega. It's the very last letter in the Greek alphabet. They don't have a Z, they have an omega. Omega starts with O, and that is a capital Omega right there, and that's why they used it, because it's a an O. It's not the letter O in the Greek alphabet, but it starts with O, so they use Omega, capital Omega. The lowercase Omega doesn't look anything like that. That looks like this. It sort of looks like a W. You'll see that in other places in physics, but you don't need it here. So that's why they use capital Omega for an Ohm. You don't want an O or an Omicron because they look too much like a zero. An Omega does not. Now I'll give you another really dumb story and I don't need to waste too much time with it because we've lost some time. The reciprocal of resistance is a thing called conductance. So they were looking for a unit to represent conductance. Now they didn't have any one person to be responsible for that. So they decided to name that unit, now I say reciprocal, uh, 1 over, so conductance, C-O-N-D, is equal to 1 over resistance. Okay? So what unit could they use for conductance? Well, they came up with one, and that unit was a mo. Now how do you reckon they come up with mo? It wasn't because Larry and Curly's friend came up with it. No, that's a different mo. Okay? How did they come up with mo? Anyone make a guess? It shows how crazy physicists are. It's one over resistance. Resistance is measured in ohm so since it's one over that, they just spelled ohms backward. Can you believe that? They made up a word. That's nobody's word in any language at all. They just named it a mo because it's one over ohm. And then if that's not enough, the symbol for a mo is this. They made up a symbol. They just took an omega and put it upside down. That's not a letter in the Greek alphabet. That's not a letter in anyone's alphabet. They just took the, and because conductance is 1 over resistance, they just turned the symbol upside down. Okay. Now, that's you're not responsible for that, but that just shows how crazy physicists are. So, Georg Ohm, Georg Simon Ohm, was the one who came up with this, a German physicist born in Bavaria, which was around... Munich, okay, and uh, his relationship is called Ohm's Law. Now, I'm not going to draw this for you, but I'm going to show you. In case some of you don't have your text, I'll show you. Not every material is what they call ohmic, but many, many common materials, as you increase the voltage, you increase the current, and it's a straight line increase. Now, all materials do that, but if they increase in that way, those are not ohmic materials. But if they increase in a straight line form, they are ohmic materials, and then Ohm's law works. Okay? And here are three representations of Ohm's law. Okay? I've 
got my pen upside down. Okay, there it is. One is that current, remember current, is represented by the symbol I. I is equal to V over R. V is voltage, R is resistance. Current is equal to voltage divided by resistance. Now, in, in terms of units, that would be an amp is equal to a volt per unit ohm. Remember, the symbol for voltage is V, and the unit for voltage is capital V. They're identically the same. One of the few times that happens. Okay. But because you can write it this way, you can also write it another way. Multiply both sides by R, and what you get then is V is equal to IR. And in units, that would be voltage is equal amps times ohms. Okay? Or you could divide everything on both sides by I of that one. And that would then give you resistance is equal to voltage over current. Or an ohm is a volt per unit amp. Three different forms for Ohm's Law. Use them in whichever way you need them. Remember the three of them. And that's another good one that if you did want to use those tri circles or triangles I told you about <laughs> way back at the first of the term, that works quite well. I think I'm going to go to a new slide. I was going to write it down here, but that box is in the way. So let's uh, clear the drawings here and Here's how you do it. If you did, come on, here you go. If you did circles or triangles, I kind of like the triangles better, but you can use either one. You do a dividing line that splits them in two, and then you do a vertical line, which is a multiplication line down here. Okay? And you always put the one V is equal to I times R. The one that when you multiply them together, V is I times R, I is equal to V over R, R is equal to V over I. So all three of them, same thing here. You just put them in the same places, relative places, V, I, and R. Okay, so if you don't want to use those, you don't have to. But that are three different ways to express Ohm's Law. Okay, and the third one there, uh, in units of ohms, an ohm is a volt per uh, ampere. Okay, I started to say coulomb, ampere, current. Okay. Now, <laughs> um, there is a little activity there that in the old days, a lot of people used to play around with at Christmas time, uh, and that's a string of lights and a small battery, um, and then play around with that. If those lights are in a way we call in series, the more lights you have, the duller they get. Um, and that's what they're talking about. So we won't go into that. We're going to talk about that later. Uh, we have two minutes left. I don't know if there's time to do example one. I think maybe there is, so let's try it. A heating element has on an electric range, that's your stove top, is um, on a 240 volt circuit. So that's your voltage is 240 volts. The symbol and the units are the same, okay? Has a resistance, well there's a resistance is R, and that's equal to 30.0 ohms, which is a pretty large resistance. Well, that's a lot of... <coughs> the question is, what current does it draw? So I is what we're looking for. That's your unknown here. And from up here, you can see I is equal to V over R. So that's equal to voltage divided by resistance. <coughs> Sorry which is 240 volts divided by 30.0 ohms. 
And by the way, they did not put a bar over that third zero on the 240, so you only have two significant digits there. When you do 30 into 240, you get 8.0. And that would be current is measured in amperes. And that's why they only give two digits because they didn't put a bar over the third the third digit in voltage. So there's example one. That ran us smack out of time. Okay. So what we'll do here is stop at that place and let me erase my mark here. Put a mark on example two. That's where we'll begin next time. And let me get my papers to hold the place. Yeah, I won't give you, well, you can do maybe the first or third example in problem set 17.6. Um, and we'll go from there. Do a, as many as you want to do there. We've got a couple, one more example to do. So you could probably do half of those if you wanted to in 17.6. All right, any questions, any issues, we'll pick up and finish 17.6 next time, move to series circuits, then do parallel circuits, and then do com compound circuits. If we have time, we'll move to chapter 18. I doubt if we'll have much time to do it, so let me go. All right, so please, folks, if you haven't turned in your... I think all of you have turned in your first test, your second test, and you may have all turned in your third test. I just don't have but four of those graded yet. Uh, uh, but if the other two have turned them in, fine. But the, that's the third test. The fourth test, a few of you have turned those in. If you haven't, please get it to me by Thursday, okay? Because Thursday, I'll be giving you the last test, chapter, the, the fifth test, and that'll be all we have this term, and your uh, that will be uh, on chapter 17, the chapter we're on right now. All right, any questions, issues, concerns, problems? All right, one more class, the one you've been dreading all time, the, all term, the last class. So we'll get as much covered in chapter 17 as we can. I'll give you your test, and then get it back to me just as soon as you can. Wonderful if you give it to me on Friday. Saturday would be fine. Sunday's the latest you can possibly get it to me and I can guarantee, try to guarantee I'll get your grade in uh, by Monday noon. Okay? Any questions? Issues? Problems? Okay? Take care folks. We'll see you on Tuesday if there's no questions. See, people are leaving already, so I'll end the meeting. Bye-bye.